I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order um, and welcome you to our uh, January work session for uh, January 9th, 2023. Um, we're joined by our interim superintendent, Vicki Beyer, and members of her cabinet and two members of the Inner City Student Council. Let's go ahead and do it. Hello, I'm Macy Saha. I'm a senior at Preble and I'm the president of Intracity Student Council. Hello, I'm Jesus Rios, a senior at East High School, a member of our Intracity Student Council. Thank you. I will do the roll call, Kinsey. Mills. Here. Lyerly. Here. Welch. Here. Leighton and Warren. Here. McCoy. Here. Becker. Here. <clears throat> Here. Okay, all uh, board members are present. Um, the next item is our open forum. Is there anyone who was hoping to speak tonight in the audience? Okay, doesn't look like there's anyone. Uh, we will move on to our first agenda item which is uh, the um, report of the education, um, not the education committee, but under education, and that will be facilitated by Andrew Becker. Uh, thank you. We have um, one item. We have a discussion item on the curriculum cycle. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Dr. Wiegan and Dr. Chartier will provide the Board of Education with a high level overview of the district's curriculum cycle. This is all in preparation for upcoming recommendations coming forward in February. Ladies. Okay, thank you um, and good evening. So the purpose of the presentation is to really provide a high level, high level overview as um, Vicki had mentioned of our district's curriculum cycle um, as it relates to the Board of Education and your role in governance, um, specifically under um, Department of Public Instruction, um, chapter PL8 school district standards. And of course there are two specific school board policies Policy 330, Curriculum Development and Instructional Improvement, and Policy 361, Instructional Material Selection. We did receive some questions in advance, which we're very appreciative of. We're gonna to try to answer those during the time that we've been provided, but if we don't, we would like to extend an invitation to any board member who would like to come in and meet and have a more in-depth discussion regarding the process. Okay, thank you. We're having trouble with keeping up. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Is it working now? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Um, like Dr. Wagan said, it's a very high overview. And again, I want to extend a welcome to meeting with uh, team my team members that work most closely in this work um, to come in and, and visit with us because we do have more specific and detailed uh, information that we could share with you um, as we go through that uh, through that presentation. First of all, uh, the um, the curriculum uh, cycle. There are really five phases to the curriculum cycle. So you often wonder what are we doing behind the scenes here. There's a, the first part. I, I'm going to address a little bit tighter. But uh, there's the planning phase. Um, then there's a development phase. And then you you have your re, you have your uh, resource um, review or adoption, and that's what will be coming in February. We have the implementation phase, and then of course the evaluation. And then for the next four years, once they have curriculum that's written and adopted, they will be what we call an implementation. So they'll take about four to five years, and we monitor it 
as it's going, but they're not in the full review cycle. So what do we do in phase one? Phase one is really where we dig in. It's our initial research. It's this piece that is continually ongoing for people that work in the curriculum uh, assessment and instruction uh, field. Um, we definitely dig into all of our Wisconsin state standards um, and our current learning expectations, um, looking at all the changes that have been made over the the uh, past uh, years um, of during uh, by teachers in facilitated by TNL in the past. We also uh, take a very in-depth look at our student achievement data. Um, we have an evaluation document in which we evaluate our current uh, resources and explore various, um, always exploring, but all, there's always new pieces coming on the market. So you have to stay on top of it so that when it's time to purchase you, you have the best of the best that meets your needs. Um, and also um, we determine, this is the team determines who's gonna be on the curriculum writing team, um, as well um, as all the forms that we will be providing for teacher feedback and teacher forward. The next phase is the development. Uh, this is probably the most commonly um, shared component of the entire phase, and that's the development uh, where you really dig into your professional learning standards, um, your content essential documents, which would be indicating what we expect all students to know and be able to do uh, as, as aligned to the course that they are representing. So that it doesn't matter where your zip code is, you will, um, if you're taking algebra one, we have same exposure to the same learning expectations as any other student taking algebra run across the district, okay? Um, this is also the interim assessments that measures, um, obviously that would measure your learning priorities. Um, this is where teachers create a blue uh, a, a course syllabus as to what would be taught. And then, um, as you know, we adopted uh, Canvas in one of our last meetings and the blueprint is actually the, like the lesson plan, shall I say, that's housed in Canvas. And um, we have more of that coming probably in March um, to give you an update on where we're, where we're going there. But the blueprint, that's where all of our curriculum would be housed in Canvas as part of that development uh, phase. Resource uh, component um, is really the, the part that it can take First of all, we have to identify and review a view, uh, all of the available resources that are on the market today. Some come off, expire. We have to look at the longevity and the plan. Um, we determine a rating system. So what did we say we wanted students to know and be able to do? What tool is going to help our teachers to ensure that the students get there and learn that? Um, also, we gather teacher feedback throughout this whole presentation. You come and visit us. And we'll show you some of the documents that are used and some of the, the teacher's feedback. Um, also, we have um, vendor presentations, and if you're interested, we have a couple vendor presentations coming up on a couple of our, our um, resource reviews that we have in place. We have a world language, um, if you're interested in seeing a vendor presentation on our world language uh, resource, um, Spanish specifically, because French is not totally developed yet. However, the content and the process will be the same for either language. Yes. Will you just shoot us a, a, some of those dates Absolutely. so people can get them on their calendar if they, if they care to, um, uh, you know, observe that process. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then we have a couple of our pieces that will be coming to you in, in February that are in the trial or the pilot. Teachers who have gone through this process volunteer to be part of the pilot and they get, they have their own exclusive training with the vendor training, then they implement and we, we support, but we learn from them as they're implementing the resource. And then we look for their feed forward as to if this resource met the teacher's needs or met what we set out, what we set out as a team that, that this should meet and will this meet teacher's needs um, in making sure all students um, have exposure to the learning. And then, and this will happen next February at this time, um, my, the team will be here and bringing a presentation and sitting in front of you with an in-depth of the process of the recommendation, all that came before the adoptions um, for uh, three content areas for right now. Um, math, high school math, uh, world language. And um, there's one that I 
think we have a little more work to do before I want to publicly say that's going to be coming for a full for the adoption. The access to ESSER funds have helped us to accelerate and rejuvenate some of the work that we had been doing like in 2019. But when you dig back into the archives, if there are missteps, we go back and we complete those steps. So some of those would be there. And then of course, the implementation teaching and learning works with um, procurement to make sure that um, we have all of the resources and we also oversee um, the distribution process We're responsible for ensuring that there's ongoing professional learning. Typically your vendor, your first year with your vendor, they first three years, they provide really intensive professional learning. Mid-school math will be here next week. Um, in all of our middle schools, actually co coaching cycles around the implementation of mid-school math, the adoption middle school math that you adopted last, last year at this time. And um, then again, the trial pilot. So those teachers that are brave risk takers and jump out ahead and do the trial pilot, they actually help all the other teachers that are kind of your colleague go to as to any challenges they might have or any suggestions they may have had to make the implementation process um, shall I say, run more smoothly. And so they're very much a part of, especially our pilot teachers are very much a part of what professional learning we need to look at to come next. And then um, we also, as part of the implementation, uh, we, have, we also have a, a monitoring component that's put in place um, so that we make sure that if there's any additional needed supports um, that we can meet those needs during those first two implementation years. So we're not locked in. It's like we're very flexible, but we're very supported by the vendor and the teachers that have helped us in con conducting the pilot program. And then uh, phase five, that's the evaluation. And you hear much about the evaluation um, when we come forward with the data um, that we have in our progress report, but it, it is in our responsibility is to, um, once we put the curriculum in place and it's, it's being used for instruction, we can closely monitor the resource and the instruction implementation to make sure that it's used the way the vendor designed it. Uh, these are pretty sophisticated um, resources that we provide and there are many components to it. We definitely wanna make sure our educators have the tools and the access to use them in the, in the most efficient and effective way. Um, we also use student achievement data. Um, and then um, we use, um, it, as I mentioned in previous presentations, we have the jury process. So every June, teachers actually uh, submit any part of the content essential documents, the resources, uh, the interim assessments that they would like the alike teacher content area to review um, to make sure that there are adjustments made to it um, that better meet what it is we're measuring for. And so those are the five phases from the helicopter view. There's obviously an enormous amount of work that goes underneath every single one of those. And that's why I strongly encourage, and, and we'll, we'll make it work. So whatever works for you, we'll make it work and we'll get some dates out to you in case you wanna join some of these um, presentation to kind of see the interaction with the vendor and the teachers and so on and so forth. So um, any additional questions? <laughs> I won. <laughs> All right, uh, any board questions? Yes. I was wondering how you may incorporate student voice in the process of deciding the curriculum. And that is, um, for instance, I've, our team just went out for world language. So I'm gonna use one that's most fresh in my memory, okay? Uh, because high school math, we have started and stopped that over two consecutive years. Um, but we actually went out and met with the students in those current courses, like in Spanish one and Spanish two. And we brought all the resources, we shared them with them. And then we had a, a feedback form. And then we just had conversation with them. And then when you come back and you figure, so you get all this data and how do you know which one will be chosen, right? Uh, the student voice weighs at 20% of the overall, the teacher's 40, and then teaching and learning or the district office who have to make sure that everything aligns is 40%. Uh, percent. But um, that's how we, we actually go right out. We survey students, but we have this year been going right to the courses where the students, where they're taught. And, it is one of the most rewarding 
components of this whole selection process. If you want to, you want to, it's amazing. It's amazing the insight they bring and how ecstatic they are. I really like this resource because I get right to it right away. It's like they are really engaged in this process. So kudos to you guys. Uh, you, you make us come alive. Thank you. And it's really great that you guys get the student voice involved in that too, because we are the people who are going to be learning the curriculum. Maybe we can get you to come to some, some of the vendor presentations too. Right. <laughs> oh, Angie, work on that. <laughs> right. Uh, yes, Brian. Uh, a follow up with that. Does that happen at all levels or mainly at the high school level or do, do we do that at high school, middle school and elementary? That's correct. We did the same thing with mid school math. We actually were right in the classroom, um, especially in the pilot rooms, because it's uh, it's kind of difficult um, to get because it's such a comprehensive, for instance, for mid school math. So they were in the pilot room and they actually asked students for feedback as they were learning. And we have all of that data and what the students provided is, you know, the, the, we definitely ask them, are you comfortable with this way of learning? If, you know, what do you what do you like or dislike about it? And again, we tailor the survey in the interview questions based on the age of the student. And could you just remind me, what's the average uh, cycle time for the curriculum? Like how often are we looking at refreshing and does it vary based on subject and area? Yes, statutorily you're supposed to review your curriculum every five years, which we do. This is really where you, the five phases here is where we really dig in. And really all aspects of CIA work, we dig into and uncover, get feet forward from all stakeholders that work with it. Um, it's, it's a very good question. Um, the, we try to time when we believe the Department of Public Instruction will be releasing new um, standards, because if you don't want to jump out and get all this work, when you're going to have to bring everybody back in the next year uh, and start all over at the curriculum unwrapping. So in, um, I believe it's in the progress report mm -hmm. from our previous year, you'll see an eight-year cycle that had all of the content areas and what year we were going to bring forward. And then a lot of things happen <laughs> that get that off kilter, but we always want to stay in front of our priority pieces. Um, but the team that will be here uh, next month to meet with you, they, they'll be able to fill you in on every little nook and cranny. You would want to know what's next, what time it's next. Um, but our high school ELA is coming in February. And I, I know we're interested, but our ELA 8 K-8 will be this time next year we will be bringing a new resource forward for um, middle school and elementary ELA adoption. And then we'll have all of our elementary, middle school, and high school math adoptions completed, and also our, our uh, literacy resources completed. So those are very, those are heavy, heavy lifts. So that's quite an accomplishment, and they're nice and tight, so that we'll really be able to follow that progression of learning. And since you mentioned the um, DPI timelines on that, have, I assume that we've had, we've worked collaboratively with DPI on this when they're looking for examples and stuff being a large district on the same cycle. So we're kind of, I don't want to say influencing, but we're we're part of that discussion too, or no? Well, that, that does local control as to how you set that up. But I can tell you what we do do. We have teachers that volunteer to actually go in and uh, review the standards and are part of the standards uh, writing and restructuring of the standards at the state level every year. Okay, that's what I'm yeah, no problem. Okay, anyone else? All right, thank you. Uh, that concludes the uh, education section. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, guys. All right, um, next on the agenda is uh, operations. We're gonna be joined by um, Nancy, I'm sorry. Le Bissonnaire. Le 
Yeah, really yeah. Um, this this will be facilitated by Don Smith, but uh, Vicky has some things she wants to share. Thanks. Um, Lori Blakesley is TIG. This work is leading for a brighter future. And uh, I want to start by thanking the ATSNR team. We have Nancy here tonight, and then uh, her teammates, Chuck and Pete, are joining us virtually. Thank you uh, for the work that you put into this. This has been a year long project that culminated in thousands of pages of documents that have all been uploaded into board docs for the community and the Board of Education to view. Um, this is going to be some heavy work over the next few months. So this is the kickoff and we're going to get a high overview, high level overview tonight of the work that they've done. Nancy. Nope. Yep. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. And I just want to, do I have permission to share screen? Okay. Just about the microphone. Whenever someone else speaks, your microphone will go off. So anytime you speak, you'll have to turn it back Thank on. Thank you. This one stays on all the time, but um, Appreciate the rest, that. the rest, you'll have to take turns. <laughs> no problem. All right. Just bear with me as I get my technology straight here and get the right screen pulled up. Let's see here. Animation. That. Let's see, and there's one more. There we go. Yes. Every sharing thing has its own little, little tweaks that we have to get to. Okay, there we go. So, all right. And um, I think, let's see here. We should be good to go. All right, as I, as you mentioned, my name is Nancy Lebissonier. I'm an architect with ATSR Architects, Engineers, and Planners. And uh, with me, I have Chuck Ho uh, Holden. Chuck, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Sorry I'm here virtually. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, welcome from snowy Minnesota, and we're excited to be here tonight. Uh, Pete. Uh, Lacey was expected to be with us. Unfortunately, he's another architect from our office. He got COVID yesterday and we thought maybe he could do remote, but he's feeling worse and worse through the day. So you're going to have to deal with just the two of us, I'm afraid, and, and listen to us talk a long time. So bear with us while we, while we uh, go through the report here. All righty. Okay, I'll I'll start out. Um, as Vicki said, and Nancy's been talking, we've, we've spent a lot of time with Green Bay Public Schools, and we've been very impressed with, with your staff, with the amount of learning that's happening in your schools, with your actual facilities. Uh, it's just been a great experience. And, and we're going through what we call the GEMS process, which is gathering a ton of information, which we've been doing for months, evaluate that information, model that uh, information, share it with the, the upcoming task force, solve the problems, and then share the message. So we call that GEMS, and we're about in the middle of that process, and now we're starting with the community engagement portion, which to me is the most exciting and, and most worthwhile as far as gathering input and finding out how the community actually feels about Green Bay Public Schools and if their impression matches what ours and yours is. And like I said, there's been a lot of work. We uh, had teams going to your sites and we would start out with a pretty clean slate and this is Sorry. kind of how things would look at the end of the meetings, um, but met with your principals, met with your, your building uh, leaders and your teachers and your, some of your students and just to get a real good handle on your facilities with, with experts that deal specifically with educational learning areas, others that dealt specifically with HVAC, roofs, windows, uh, all the mechanicals. And, uh, and so we've got a pretty good feel now for uh, all of your facilities. So we, oh. sorry, oh, I'm sorry. 
you'll have to excuse us a little bit. We're not as smooth as we should be because Pete's normally in here. So if we, we're a little jerky now and again, I apologize for that. So uh, before we kind of get into the results of the report, we wanna spend a little time on future ready learning environments because that's one of the pieces that we look at when we're doing the educational adequacy portion of the analysis. Because as you know very well, as educational uh, needs are changing, we're finding that the facilities, older facilities weren't necessarily designed for those and kind of looking for what can we do to set up your facilities for the future to allow for that. So we're evaluating uh, those items. So the, the things that we're looking at here um, that we really consider to be key principles are a variety of learning set, uh, settings, connection and flexible spaces, uh, identity and community, safety and security, and of course, a quality environment. So starting out with variety of furniture, and this is Edison and Martin Elementary School, showing that students out are all learning in the same method that, you know, at least when I grew up, um, uh, everyone's sitting at the classroom desk all the time. So these soft type furnitures, different types of uh, settings for students in small groups has been very effective. Uh, spaces for pullout for, for one student to work on a project individually. And one-on-one, -on -one, the teacher can, can meet with a student in this example showing at Eisenhower um, uh, just off of a hallway of making better use of those spaces. And collaborative spaces for students. Baird Elementary, we have several examples because obviously it's a newer school. A lot of these concepts have been incorporated, but showing a uh, collaborative space where students can get together and they've got the technology and got the area to work. And places to present where we still need uh, lecture. We need areas for students to put their devices, uh, which is different. And large group meeting spaces are still very important. Hands-on learning with um, pull down, uh, again, access for technology and, and uh, just spaces to be able to work. And outdoor learning spaces are important. Again, Baird showing the courtyard and we've got several facilities and schools we worked with, with students having the ability in science classes to go out, for example, and plant vegetables and harvest those vegetables, um, that type of thing. So the, the second uh, principle that we're looking at is really connection and flexible spaces. So you have an example here in Eisenhower Elementary um, that the space can be configured in a lot of different ways for many usages. And that's really a valuable space to have in a, in a facility. And it also extends to flexible furniture that can be moved around and reconfigured uh, and that you know people of different sizes can sit in different things and where you're comfortable, just like if, if you wanna hang out at the, at the coffee shop or, or wherever, not everyone picks the same furniture to be in. So uh, flexible space also includes things like uh, different types of, types of doors and partitions that can be opened up. We found uh, facilities who had this during COVID found it tremendously valuable um, because it gave them the, the uh, way to be able to partition as they needed to or open up when they needed to and, and really allow that flexibility to work the way they needed to and that creating visual connections um, so you can do passive supervision that can be from the classroom views outside all of those kind of things to really be able to to allow different those different groupings and still maintain your security and your supervision and the things that you need to have and this is just an example of that, some of that happening outside of the classroom with windows into the classroom. So the teacher has that passive supervision. Um, and the connection to the outdoors visually is important from the standpoint, even of just natural light. All the studies you've probably heard about natural light being so good for kids and um, increasing actually scores for test scores and those kind of things when you have natural light being so important and that opportunities to even bring it outside and do classwork um, outside if you can. Okay, identity and, and community, We're, uh, welcoming admit, uh, entry points to schools we think are important, not just for the community, but for the students, just their, their sense of belonging and, and uh, how they feel about their school. It really sets the tone. Reinforced school community is an example of Burnsville, Minnesota, but we've got several also in Green Bay, 
um, where, where just, again, student pride. And here's one at Edison Middle School, a uh, good example of, of putting those ideas, those good concepts in front of students on a regular basis. And celebrating student work, being able to put uh, student having access points or, or hallways and locations where you can exhibit artwork and, and you can build that pride that the students have and, and parents can have access to see it. And learning on display, um, you know, making use of areas under stairways for students to, to learn. And using the building as a teaching tool is an interesting concept. And we've seen more and more of this, uh, again, using, um, you know, measuring points or, or different conceptual ideas put on walls. And community spaces, we all know, are important. Again, uh, example at Baird, um, just showing that the multiple uses of areas um, and we'll be actually uh, convening our first task force meeting at Baird in this space and making use of it for that purpose. But I, I know that over the years, you've already used this for several different events. Uh, community space at Martin Elementary School, just showing how, again, the soft furniture can be used in areas that previously, you know, haven't been, maybe were underutilized just to have more pullout areas and areas for students. The fourth uh, principle relates to safety and security. So we're also probably familiar with secure entries and how important those are. And you guys have done a, a pretty good amount of work in, in that regard. But really, it's it's more than that. It also relates to things like building zoning. Now, in a new building, we're able to uh, situate the area so that you can keep your public on one side and your classroom area on the other side and, and have zoning between those two. But it's also a part... Um, involves, create if you can, creating layers of zoning so that not all the security has to happen at the classroom door. If you can have it in multiple locations, then that allows you to do more of what we've been talking about with these other visual passive supervision and things like that, and, and still be able to manage and balance those learning needs with the security needs. So you don't have to close up your classroom so tight if you're able to do uh, zoning in other areas. And that includes things like even elementary school restrooms, for instance, so that so that the teacher can see the kids washing their hands and there's not shenanigans going on in the back way when they're washing hands, right? Um, exterior security, of course, is important um, when you have events at a high school or at any time really to control your traffic and um, where people are entering and exiting, uh, how the circulation works. Is there enough in the right places when you have whole groups of people coming for an event at a stadium? Is there safe exiting? All of those kind of things are important. So for, for quality environments, that's Ch uh, that's Chuck. Sorry, Chuck. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> the, the actual <clears throat> building structure, the indoor environment, natural light in this example, lighting, acoustics, air quality are all important. Technology is is you know growing. We all know this on a on a daily basis. So, incorporating that into learning areas for the students and energy efficient and sustainable uh, materials, uh, windows that are more efficient than they were when they were designed maybe in the fifties. Uh, HVAC systems that are that are very efficient. ADA accessibility, not just because you have to by federal mandate, but because it's the right thing to do. And you've, I know you've got parent groups interested in this type of thing and fundraising, and but that's something we need to keep in, in the forefront at all times too, is accessibility. Um, so our facility study report, I think I keep going here, Nancy, don't I? Uh, um, let's see. Let me talk a little bit about this piece and then... then Okay. Sorry, yeah. And then uh, then we'll have Chuck jump back in here. So the, the pieces that you just saw there, those five sections then get, um, these are just in a snapshot of one part of the scorecard then that we put together that looks at those for all the different schools. So for the whole analysis, we're, we're basically doing a stoplight um, type of 
of uh, nomenclature. So you'll see the red as needs most improvement. Um, yellow is usually fair and green is good. So easy to understand visually. And so this is just a shot from the middle high school and other um, areas and um, you know, gets you a sense even visually of, of how these are working. And then there's an average score across the bottom. Let's see, and the, um, as you can see there, there's the, the spaces and then it gives you an overall, um, as we look at each building, each one has a, a scorecard with a stoplight that shows you in each category, which one of those things there are. And then this is a, um, we have a lot of different tables that throughout the report that shows you how, that analyze the data in different ways to help you understand it. So um, this is just an example of um, the kind of the range that we're seeing across um, for the educational adequacy score and it's different colors for different types of building. And then let's see, this one, Chuck, I believe is, this is related to capacity. So I'm gonna let Chuck talk about this a little bit. Yeah, and actually I could spend uh, the rest of the night talking just about this one slide. It, it's complex, there's a lot of data here. I'm not gonna go through it all, but uh, suffice it to say that that uh, in, Green Bay, in Green Bay schools, like many school districts, you've got excess capacity, and we've spent a lot of time looking at uh, maximum capacity of a building, which you don't want to function at. It, it can be even detrimental for moving uh, in hallways, for core areas, for cafeteria, for buses. Uh, so maximum capacity is the number on the far left. Ideal capacity for, uh, for our purposes we assume 90% maximum capacity. Um, and then we, we indicate current enrollment in all the school seats to ideal capacity, just, just uh, moving that bar to an individual basis. Uh, current enrollment to ideal capacity comparisons and what the percentage is, uh, seats to maximum capacity um, maximum enrollment, seats to ideal capacity at maximum enrollment. We go through all of this and then go out 10 years to projected numbers in 2023. So here's a little bit clear, uh, you know, more close up view of that. And, and the bottom line is um, if you filled your schools to capacity, again, not recommended, but there's almost 7,000 additional seats at this point. Um, and, and going out to another 10 years if projections stay as they are. We all know there's a lot of factors that can play into that, um, but it could be up to 9,400 uh, extra seats. Now going to ideal capacity, or at least our impression of ideal capacity right now, we're at 4440 additional seats and that can grow up to almost 7,000 in 10 years. So we're at a point, and this will be something that we that we talk a, a great deal about with the task force, um, where you've got you've got you're investing money in space that you don't need. And it's time to take a good look at where you can better utilize that space, uh, make improvements to spaces, and then potential uh, cut back on some of these spaces. So it's a it's a shot at that. There's a there's a lot that goes into this, and there's a lot of caveats to this because capacity in buildings can be affected by many things, as, as you all are aware. Special education programming is just one uh, where where the the numbers instead of being 24, 25, 26 to one in a typical classroom could be eight to one. So there are a lot of factors that play into this and a lot of discussion has to happen when you look at building capacities. And this is uh, another view of capacity and then it extends it to the actual physical site. And most of your locations, if you look at that red column, as Nancy indicated, if you're thinking stop signs, there's a big uh, literally a red flag there. And that is not a true picture because you've got collaboration with the city and you've got so many sites that are sharing uh, city park space, but your actual school owned property uh, compared to the recommended uh, acreage is, is under capacity. 
So it, uh, and then there's a look on the yellow column of the square feet per student where uh, our recommendation is about 250 square feet per student. And in a lot of cases, you're under that. Um, in some cases, you're over that, but in, in a lot of schools, you're under that. And uh, a good example of how that can happen is you've got, as, as most or many school districts do, especially with older facilities, you've got shared cafeteria and um, gym space. And that is greatly impacting the, the square footage per student. So it, that can skew that, that view. It's not strictly talking about a conventional classroom. Uh, so our calculated ideal capacity can vary from the districts or it does vary from the districts. Maximum projected enrollment uh, is 76% of ideal capacity on average. So we are underutilizing, in our opinion, our building space enrollment is projected to decline. And with declining birth dates, it's going to continue. And that is a national trend. It's not just happening in, in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And in 10 years, enrollment, uh, if, if things play out the way they, they currently are projected, would be 67% of ideal capacity. And uh, just as you know, we've got several graphs basically showing the same thing. And here's a here's a breakdown on that percentage, showing you 72% uh, average for all schools, and then 70% um, elementary middle school average, and just kind of showing you how that breaks down across the buildings. And spare seats at maximum enrollment. <clears throat> and square footage per student. And that's what we, we mentioned again, that, um, that recommended square footage is 250 square feet. And, and uh, this is how that breaks down across the schools. So we're going to show an example now of, as you dig into report of what you would see for one particular building and kind of how briefly how to read that. So each on the educational adequacy side, and I should say there's four volumes to this whole thing. Um, we've got a summary um, volume and, and that also has the educational adequacy piece. There's an, uh, there's an appendix to that section that has many interviews and and surveys and all of the background work and the standards and all the background work that's been done with educational adequacy and and then on the facility side there's a summary volume and then there's so many <laughs> with 42 buildings there's so much data that we had to split it into um the educational or excuse me the elementary and um elementary buildings in one and um the high school, middle school, and other type buildings in the other one. And then there's a another volume, a fourth volume on the facilities assessment side that's that appendix, which is the standards, the replacement standards, the interviews that we held. So just, just a huge ton of data here <laughs> to look at. So this is an example on the educational adequacy side. And so we give you a brief summary of, of what we found per building um, in a, um, in a, written form. And then this is an example of the site um, for one building. And again, there's that stoplight um, that you're seeing there with, as you know, site, you got small, a lot of small sites. So you'll see a lot of red for the, um, for the site size. Um, and sometimes traffic flow can be a little tricky in, in your sites. And as you probably are well aware of, um, and so we're identifying areas of heavy traffic, where the entries are, where busing is, um, and then the keynotes at the bottom would identify particular issues to, issues to that site. Um, this is an example of, um, this is not from your district, but just an example of a building um, that shows how this educational adequacy um, diagram really takes all of this information that we have and puts it in visual form. So you have the same, as you see on the left-hand side, there are those, those same uh, things that we just talked about for future ready learning environments, kind of the scorecard for those. And then we also have um, the adequacy as far as size and square footage. So Wisconsin doesn't have exact um, recommended sizes for, for educational spaces. 
And so because of that, we use Minnesota's as a reference point. Now, I should say to that, that just because something is, um, uh, is not the same thing as the app, doesn't meet that um, capacity or isn't the same size as the required size, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. It just may mean that you have less kids that fit in there and therefore it works fine. So it may be working fine for you. It's just that it happens to be under the standards and we have to have something to use as a baseline. So, so keep that in mind as you're, as you're reading through the report. Um, and since, as you know, you're, you're under capacity right now, that's partially the reason why this is still working pretty well for you because even though some of these spaces might be small, you've got less kids in them. So, um, so you can so we are we are identifying the types of spaces there as you see down in the the um, kind of the rainbow of colors working their way down um, things that are uh, rooms that are undersized relative to standards have the red box around them and the slash through them so those are the spaces that are undersized and then we have again specific keynotes to related to particular issues within the building that you can that can be um, read. And then when you get to high schools and middle schools, of course, you have a whole nother piece, which is utilization. So utilization, um, because you have kids moving around all the time, and I think you guys are probably pretty familiar with that whole aspect of it and, and um, how well those spaces are being used per period as the kids are moving around. So ideally, you want to be in that 85% range usually is what we, we are looking for. Um, and so what this is doing is looking at utilization. So this is just a close up of in at the high schools and middle schools, there's these extra little boxes floating for each individual space. And so this is giving in more detail what the function is versus orange is just classrooms, right? But this is giving you, okay, this is math, right? That kind of thing. Um, and it tells you for that particular classroom what the util classroom, what the utilization rate is. So this one happens to be 100, which is not so good. <laughs> we don't want to be there. Um, so that's red. Um, if it's good utilization, we're about kind of in the range we want to be, it's green. In, in this case, we're actually using yellow as an underutilization. So this room happens to be down all the way at 49% underutilized so that it's yellow. Kind of a yoo-hoo, we're, we're underutilized there. So then we get to the facility assessment side. So that's all been the educational adequacy half. We had one whole team doing that. We had another whole team doing the facility assessment side for the physical condition of the buildings. So just a few notes before we get into the details on that. So the assessment is capturing a point in time, which was starting about last January or so into June. And so of course, last summer, this past summer, you did some work on the buildings, right? Well, we can't always be picking up all of those pieces, we'd never be done. You guys would get deathly sick of us. So, <laughs> so it's at that moment of time and reflects that moment in time. It does not necessarily acknowledge the November 22 referendum items, um, especially because many of those items are actually improvements that are not necessarily, you know, when we see the condition of, I don't know, the the facilities at West, the first, I didn't automatically put in there, I'm gonna give you a whole new stadium, right? That wasn't, that's a decision that was made beyond the scope of, of what we were doing here. So they're not, so it's it's of its moment in time and reflects those. And of course, when this is done, the re, we didn't know whether the referendum would pass or not. So it, it you know, it's that picture at that time. Um, costs or project costs, they are conservative there. So they are including construction costs plus, um, fees and permits and all of those other things, soil borings, all those things that it goes in to, to make a project. Um, and they allow for whether it's a small project or a large project, we wanna cover you basically. So if you're gonna do a really big project, well, there's some economies of scale there, but we can't guarantee you're always gonna do that. So we're trying to take care of you with the cost here basically. Um, costs are set to March 22, um, which is right in there when we were starting to get data in. Um, and so when we start uh, budgeting options as we go forward with the task force here, those costs will be inflated first from March 22 to present, and that will be done with something called the ENR BCI, which is Engineering News Record Building Construction Index. It's an index of construction costs in various regions that's been done for years and years that we keep track of all the time, and, it'll, and it has 
these index numbers that allow us to take one March 22 and take today and figure out what the exact inflation should be, not a guess. Oh, it's been this. Well, and you know, we all know inflation's been a little crazy lately, right? So we need to know the real number to get us from here to there. And then from there forward, we will we will inflate to a future bid date. So you need to go to that point. And of course, we're gonna need to have some discussions about well, what number do we use, right? For future inflation, it's a little tricky right now. Um, so that's part of what we'll we'll go through to try to decide what the comfort level is about what that inflation number should be as we move forward. So just a quick note about MacArthur Elementary before we start. So and this is maybe not a surprise to some of you who are familiar with the building. Uh, we are recommending that MacArthur not be used for student use anymore, that it be acknowledged, uh, demolished, excuse me. Um, there are several conditions in the building that are very, very difficult to correct. Um, you have some foundation settlement occurring there from some soil uh, conditions going on, especially in the corner of the gym, the one picture on the one side there on the right. Um, you can, there's a good inch and a half of settlement in the corner of one of the bathrooms there. Um, it's just crazy, um, the amount of settlement that's going on in that building. You also have the, the picture on the left is um, down into a sump where there's running water. You have underground um, water table there that's moving all the time. And if the sump pump, and, and you have, of course, a primary and a secondary sump pump, you guys have done everything you can do there um, to take care of things. Um, but if back in the past when there wasn't a secondary sump pump, if the primary went out, then you're flooding your boiler room and your electrical equipment. Not so great. So um, there's there's just some conditions there and other even with the, the layout of the building that you have uh, these little wedge shaped, shaped classrooms um, that are not ideal for learner, learning because there's no closure. They're not they're too small. Walls don't go up to structure. There's a lot of things going on there and so for that reason we really feel that the best and a most appropriate thing there is to demolish that building and so because of that we are including the building demolition cost from foundation up um, into the into the assessment not necessarily whole site because we don't know what you're going to do with the site but the building itself okay so that's macarthur so that's why you'll go, well, why isn't that number very big? Well, because it's just it's just the building demolition. That's why. And because it's pretty difficult to quantify cost-wise, how would you address these issues when they're not really fixable? Okay, so I mentioned the volumes over here. I jumped ahead of myself. Here's all, here's all the volumes, the summaries, the early learning, elementary, uh, middle school, high school, other, and then we have the appendices. So this is an example, uh, again, on the facility side of tank, um, and here we are showing some, we are including some photos of deficiencies um, to be able to help people better understand those uh, and, and we're in with the summary. And, and uh, let's see, well, and then we also, and this goes through all the disciplines and says, what are the, what are the issues and deficiencies with architectural, mechanical, electrical, working all the way through there. So this, uh, we have done something that most firms typically don't do on the facility assessment side. Um, we have taken the information from our big old nasty spreadsheets that aren't so fun for everybody to be able to read and understand and get a grasp on. And we've put that information in graphic form so that this might be easier for you to get a handle on really what that, what's going on in a particular building. And again, this isn't your district, this is a different school, but um, it's the same stoplight thing happening here where the, the most urgent items are red, um, medium priority is yellow, low priority is green. And so um, we've got notes that are general to the building and then we have specific keynotes for items. And um, you may see these combination kind of things like FE1, which is furnish, um, excuse me, finishes and equipment. Um, and the reason we do that is because when you have cabinetry or casework, because we want to use the nomenclature, all this, all these jargon things we like to throw at you for, forgive me for the jargon. Um, the, uh, when we have casework that needs to be replaced, then it affects a lot of other things. It, it can affect your floors and your paint on the walls and all those things. So we do a combination number that gets you all those things in one, um, in one fell swoop. 
we feel that it's important if you're going to go and replace casework to look at it from the standpoint of what is the right thing for future ready learning and not ne necessarily by rote, just put in the same stuff that was there before. Because if it's there from the 50s or the 30s, that not, might not necessarily meet the same learning modalities that you want to have now. So if you're going to do it, it's an opportunity to say, should we be doing something different? And then when you do something different, you're going to affect other things. So, um, so that, that Ooh, Nancy, can we get a question quick? It's not a question. I just want to uh, tell anyone who's watching this presentation that they won't see any floor plans from our school district up here for security reasons. So if they're searching for them, they're not there. They've been redacted uh, for uh, because it's part of our security plan. Thanks. This one. Did I do the wrong thing? Is this supposed to be off? All right, sorry. I'll figure it out by the end. Okay, so so this is an example of, of one of them. And you know, you'll know you see things in the red, of course, highlighted ones are the, the biggest issues. So in, in this particular building, they didn't have an elevator. Well, that's kind of a big deal, <laughs> right? So that one's red. Uh, so, and we do the same thing with, with uh, mechanical and electrical highlighting biggest issues. So again, it's a way to get your arms around all these mountains of data. We also show building age um, so that you get a handle. And of course, building age, you know, really can have an impact on how much maintenance you're doing on a regular basis, how many issues you may, ongoing issues you may continue to have. So this is an example of the spreadsheet and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail um, if anyone has questions that, you know, and wants to dig into some of the stuff, we're happy to answer questions, um, but it's basically getting all that information in and it's the same idea that we've got the red is that highest priority, um, yellow is medium, green is low. Um, one note about the low priority items, <clears throat> excuse me, and when you're seeing those numbers, um, the district asked that um, certain of the high um, um, high maintenance cost items like roofs and mechanical and turf and those kind of things be tracked out for 30 years. So those items that are okay now, but if, you know, after that um, 10 year time frame, those are in the green. So those items, that dollar amount gets pretty inflated because you're looking out 30 years. And for turf, for instance, that has to be replaced every 12, 13 years or so, it's in here twice. So the don't get freaked out by the by the low priority number. I guess is what I'm saying because there's a lot of those long term items in there. So we have the summaries then that that go through again high priority, medium, low um, for each building. This is just a clip of that. And so this is the kind of the big reveal total, I guess you could say. So um, that high priority items, you're in the you know 69 million and again remember this is march 22 numbers would have to get inflated inflated but um so you're in that 69 million of high priority items and um that 196 or so of of medium priority so the two of them together that's where you get that almost well 154 ish 155 ish or 254 ish 55 ish of medium and high priority together um and what we typically find for a lot of districts, um, well, and it just varies, of course, on what the funding sources are and what, you know, it just because this number is sitting in here doesn't mean that all of this is going to go into a referendum, obviously, because you have long term facilities maintenance money and you have capital money and you have all sorts of pots of money that you are using over time. And this is meant to be a planning tool to help you manage all the issues and identify them and be able to work with them over time. So we really find that. Um, for most districts, it depends, well, it depends on how many of the issues that they have, but um, you may not get to all the medium priority items right away because sometimes the dollar amount's just too big, right? And there's the other piece of this is that this does not necessarily um, get to remodeling or additions that would address anything on that educational adequacy side. So things we would do for future ready learning or to add that cafeteria, or gym that's missing, all of those kind of, that money's not in here. So, and because, and it's not in here because 
that comes next, basically, right? As you start moving forward to figure out what you might wanna look at doing to particular buildings. So that's the other thing to keep in mind. This is not all the money. There's other, there's other things that need to be addressed to get at some of those educational adequacy issues. Okay, and this is just this is just again another way of looking at it. So you can see the um, <laughs> elementary school, high school, middle school, and as you would expect, high schools are much more square footage. They're bigger, even though you only have four of them. There's a lot of square footage there. So as far as dollar amounts, they're actually not that far off all of the elementaries combined. Um, and so. And, and that's you see high and and for the medium priority that is and then for the high priority high priority stuff you got more going on at the elementary level than than you do at the other ones so again just another way of looking at the information we also have breakdowns by type of um of area or um component so this is just an example of of um, site and you start to see roofs so roofs are as you can see there, a large percentage, because no surprise, you just had two bids, they're not cheap, right? So, so when you have a big roof area to do, of course, that has a big impact on, on the numbers. And so you'll see that um, in there as it moves forward. So this is another way to look at that data, again, high and medium priority as it works its way across. The, some of the big hitters, that you'll see when we get into more. So this is works works its way across the type of schools with each individual school. Um, this starts to break down between exterior envelope, um, interior site, and systems. So systems is also a big hitter, as you know. When you replace, when you do mechanical upgrades, that's a big that's a big hitter, right? And so, for example, um, you'll see Kennedy is that middle one, the big red one shooting up there. That's because you need full mechanical upgrades over at Kennedy. And so that's why that number is high. Um, Sullivan is another one that needs new windows and, and needs mechanical, so that one shoots up. So those are, those are kind of things that, sh that show up in the, in the vertical. So there's the example of Kennedy that I got ahead of myself. So this is, again, just a, a different way to look at the information, shifting it around. So the systems is the dark pink. Um, interiors, the light pink envelope is the um, is the dark and you got a little bit of sight there. And we think envelope's pretty important as you would expect if you're gonna maintain your building, you don't want it to fall apart from the outside in. So that's something that to um, that we think that, you know, we tend to look at those as a higher priority if we see issues. And there's just an example of those again. So this one is a different one altogether. All the other things you were looking at or priority of, of um, so we, we are looking at both condition and priority because just because something is maybe in poor condition, it may not necessarily be a high priority for you to replace, right? And the, um, when we met with a facility staff, they told us to go ahead and if, if it's just flooring uh, by itself to automatically list it as low priority because you guys have your own flooring replacement system that you're, that you're doing on an ongoing basis. So um, this one actually is looking just at physical condition, how we're rating condition. And if um, in each line across here up in the upper portion, um, if that is over 5% of the replacement cost of the building, it goes red. And when you get to the bottom, down that bottom whole piece, if it's over 50% of the replacement cost of the building, it goes red. Now, those are actually a little orangey red. They look red, red it's really hard to get them, <laughs> the color to behave itself. Uh, none of them are actually 50. They're the, the worst one I think is mid forties uh, relative to replacement cost of building, but it gives you a sense because all these other things are like it's just this dollar amount, right? But this just sort of tells you, even if you have a little building and you have a smaller amount of work, it can be a big impact on a small building and you got a lot of small elementaries. So it's helpful to understand relative to replacement cost of the whole building. And we use, of course, a, you know, a, a cost per square foot that's an average. You got, it depends on the size of the school, right? Because if you're building a teeny tiny little elementary, that's gonna cost more per square foot than if you're building a bigger, more efficient elementary school. So it, it's, you don't need to get too caught up in the individual numbers exactly and go, oh, this is 46 and this is 30, this, you know? It's really more about general feel of it and kind of, okay, this one's, 
you know, we got a lot of work to do here relative to the replacement cost versus this one's not so bad. So it's just kind of an overall different way to look at it. And so here's a here's a close up of that. So um, let's see, am I wanting to, will it let me do that? No, it won't. I have a click to join audio that won't go away here. Ah, I shouldn't have done that. Shoot, bear with me. I messed it up. I was trying to get so I could read something and I messed it up. Okay, so I'm there and then I gotta go back to here. Oh, and then of course it won't let me do that. Okay, bear with me guys. Sorry about that. It's Keith. okay, we've all been there. Yes. <laughs> PowerPoint, ain't it great? Okay, <laughs> let's see. Table, 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 table. More, more, we're getting there. Getting there, close, close. Okay, there we are, I'm not moving. Um, let's see. So, and I can't remember what that building is because it's covered up the one that's right at the top. I can't read it. The third one over Beaumont. Yeah, so for example, um, and let's see, can I read it in red? Well, so the, 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 the number that's in the red is the percentage of a building replacement. And then below that is the actual total in dollar in million. So 4.7 million is what is, um, is what's in there. Uh, for that actual uh, cost that it's comparing to. <clears throat> okay, so then we get to combined scores. So again, we got this mountain of data, right? We got a mountain of facility data. We got a mountain of, of educational adequacy data. And we wanted to say, how can we take all of this and make it manageable for you to be able to, to get a handle on a building as a whole? And so we've, we've done a combined score that takes the educational adequacy side, takes the takes both the condition and the priority scores, puts all of them in there to get a facility and educational adequacy score. And this just goes through a few of the piece of it. So um, we have the educational adequacy piece that's sitting in here and also talks about year of construction and the unweighted average building age, which can be informative. Now this isn't necessarily taking a weighted average that is taking, you know, this piece is the 39 pieces only this big and whatever. It's just unweighted average. Excuse me. Um, and then we also are getting the the capacity enrollment, um, kind of the 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 highlights basically uh, on that uh, kind of the data piece that you're seeing in there. And then uh, the piece on the left is getting back to Again, your uh, some some of those specific costs by scope, um, both by priority, and and then you also see in the orange and blue there is the version by condition. So you have everything is just one. You get a scorecard sheet for each building that gives you all the data um, in one place. Uh, in the middle, we have those educational adequacy scores um, for for that building, and then we go to. So here's where your summary is basically of all these things that were. We're adding together to get that one combined score. Let's see, uh, is that the one? Okay. And one note about this, of course, obviously just because one is one point above or the other doesn't mean that that building is you know, worse than this building. There's a lot of pieces that are coming into here and there's a lot of factors that, that are kind of going back and forth. Some are high in one, others are high in the other. So of course it's not a perfect system, but it's a it's a, a means to get some kind of a get our arms around this in a in some kind of a fashion. So then the other thing um, that we've done here is we we've, we've put it on maps for you so that you can see uh, which buildings have a combined score above seventy five and again yellow is that fifty to seventy five a score below fifty uh, is um, is in red so you can start to see where in the district are the buildings that have the lowest combined scores. Okay, so that was a whole bunch of data, <laughs> of information. And, and I should say, Josh, can you tell them where they access detail if you wanna dig into more? Yeah, I know a lot of those slides were probably hard to see, but those are grabbed from the actual report itself, which exists in PDF out on board docs. 
um, board members, if you would like an unredacted version, um, as Laura mentioned, the um, the floor plans are redacted in the ones that are posted publicly for um, for school safety reasons. So if you would like an unredacted copy with the floor plans, please let me know and I can get you a copy. Um, yeah, that's where to find it. Okay, I'll jump back in. This is Chuck again. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, there'll be a test on all this tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and you just, you know, you're essentially bored. You're running the equivalent of a, a fairly large city in your facility. Uh, Josh, I don't know. And Nancy, maybe you know the exact square footage. I'm guessing it's, you know, 6 million square feet or something. Or, you're dealing with four million. Um, it, it's a huge. I mean, you have a huge amount of facilities and a huge amount of things that have to be taken into consideration. So, um, questions uh, before we talk about next steps on any aspect of this. I know it's overwhelming. Brian. Uh, the final summaries that you had on the last two slides. Do you know which? Volume. Those are. The one that has the guy. Yeah. Okay, I'll figure this out eventually. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> that all is in volume one. All the summaries are in volume one. Make it easy. So, for the combined. Andrew, you had a question. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the map here, specifically the um, elementary school map in 1A with uh, some with the color coding, and um, um, it's a good map. I just want to make sure I'm looking at what I'm what I'm reading correctly. So, for example, um, in towards the, I'm looking at Lincoln and um, Elmore. So that's saying that there's a capacity, and that's your recommended capacity the 90 percent level or is that the max i am on that map so the capacity i keep wanting to hit the wrong button all right sorry um in this case this is maximum capacity this is not ideal capacity which ideal is dropping that 90 percent um, it's our calculation of maximum capacity, and even that can vary a little bit from yours as far as how you calculate it. And Josh, you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, and it, it kind of came up um, a little bit before. We, we've we got, first of all, some smaller classrooms, right? So when they were going through and calculating their max capacity, they're looking at the board policy for class size, multiplying it times the number of classrooms. Well, for example, in Da Vinci, Tammy's got a couple of classrooms that can only fit 14 kids. And, you know, there are a lot of situations like that out there. So that's one reason why you will see capacities differ from what the district has calculated in the past. Then also we've got some specialized programming. Think about our AGR schools where we've made a conscious decision to staff below the, um, the actual board policy in those schools. Um, you know, to make use of those grant funds um, and to help those students. And the same is true at Head Start. In, in that case, they're federally capped um, by the number of students they can have in a classroom, which is below our um, below our board policy. So that, that's one thing to be careful about um, a little bit with regard to maximum capacity. Um, it It's, um, yeah, I just, I guess I just wanted to say that. And there's, I'm going to get it this time. Okay. So even um, like when we're counting class, we're not counting any rooms that you that are used for special ed or any other special programs as a typical classroom when we're counting standard capacity. And of course, that changes every year, right? Which ones that they are using. And of course, we did it based on last year and this year it changes again. So, you know, that's that's none of these numbers are going to be right on because there's a lot of variables that are happening in the field as we're looking at them and you know related to specific programs and as we move forward doing planning that's why we want to keep for sure under that 90% you know when we're when we're looking at it because we we need to allow some flex in there to make sure that you're taken care of 
Andrew. Um, so given that there are unique features here, especially AGR that are not accounted for the numbers on this map necessarily, um, well, <clears throat> simply multiplying by 25 would make, seems like it would make sense for uh, step step one. Um, why wouldn't we go through in a, and use a capacity more in line, whether it's a max capacity or whatever, we're not going to put 25 kids in a classroom in an AGR in an AGR classroom because of the grant. So why wouldn't we, why wouldn't that have just been modified before it was presented here? Because it makes it look like there's more extra spaces than there ever would be. So I, I think part of this gets back to programs change all the time and where buildings might be, AGR buildings might be one year and that may change over time. And especially if you start to look at at how buildings may be repurposed or, or whatever, that may change. So we're trying to get a handle on the physical building and not so much tie ourselves to the specific programming at the time. And so that, and as we move forward here, however, that will definitely come into more effect as you start to make sure that you have enough of them per se, right, that are, that meet that requirement, but it might not, it may or may not be in the same building that it is now. So we're trying to, it's that tricky balance that we have to keep between the physical building that you've got to work with and what you're putting in it where, right? And, and as we look at that moving forward, we have to keep those things in mind. But when we're evaluating, if we, if we made that adjustment, we wouldn't be, be um, adequately representing the physicality of the physical spaces of the building. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, that's <clears throat> sure. That's fair because a building could have, perhaps, could hypothetically have grade levels included that are not a, a different configuration of grade levels, and AGR is only certain grade levels. So, thank you for that. I understand that. And then um, Lincoln and Elmore have exactly the same set of numbers. I'm assuming that must have been a, a typo. They're not the same size at all, but they both have 350, 139, and 211 on the map. So I think one of them just got, I think one of them just got. Oops, I did, sorry. Thank you. Okay, do we have any more questions? James. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the financials correctly. So you have a line item that's priorities one and two. And then you have them broken out, right? And so I'm making an assumption based on the presentation tonight that one and two are tracked 10 years, right? So if we're thinking about the pots of money from which we're going to draw to pay off the 250 million or as the recommendations come out of the um, task force. But um, the priority threes, I think what you said was they track 30 years but some of that spend might be recommended in the first 10. Is that an appropriate assumption? I keep paying the wrong one. All right. So uh, the low priority items um, are typically, even for items that are not mechanical or electrical, um, it is still recommended that those are um, done in, in later years if they're low priority. So. So the, the high priority is years like one through three. Um, medium priority is, well, three to, yeah, well, I should clarify. One to three, uh, one to, you know, that first few years basically for high priority. And then you kind of get in that three to five year range um, for medium. And then it's, yeah, I take it back. I have, I have to get this all straight in my head again, I apologize. And then once you're out like five to 10, that's when you get that lower priority stuff that's not mechanical or roofs or those kind of things, like the five to 10 year, that's some of that's lower priority. So you're correct. There's some of those items that are in the green, but they're farther out in time for your 10 year work. And what we've talked about with, with um, the facilities group is um, having a, a sit down to, because this is of course our 
interpretation, right, based on what we know about your buildings and what we found. Your facility staff has, of course, in-depth knowledge of all of these buildings. So there may be things that they feel um, they want pushed to higher priority because they know, oh, I got an ongoing off and on thing. It may have been fine when you were there, but I know that this does this all the time, right? And we can't necessarily, we did a lot of surveys and looked for those things, but we can't find every, you know, unearth every little pebble. So there may be, um, there may be some situations where they want to upgrade or downgrade something and we're going to work with them moving forward to help use the tool and, and be able to you know, so the numbers will probably change over time as your facility staff says, eh, you know what, this is this is going to be okay for longer term, we can move this to low, but this has got to be pulled up, that kind of thing. Okay, I appreciate that. And I want to thank Josh and uh, Andrew both kind of indicated that looking at the report, there are a few discrepancies. The reasons why the discrepancies um, really doesn't matter as long as is there a process or as this is now public and people start interrogating the document and, and finding other things, right? Uh, yeah, well, well, it's not about being perfect, but also understanding what your intent is. Um, what is there going to be a process for additional data validation? Because ultimately, especially around populations, you know, you're, when you're in utilization, those are going to be really key data points upon which we're going to base decisions. So have we envisioned a way for whether it be facility administration or whatever, building administrators to go in and, you know, basically take their sheets and say, yeah, I, I, I buy in, this is close enough where it represents the building. So on the, the educational um, stand, adequacy standpoint, they have done that for this past year. The principals have gone through and each of them looked at their their buildings and we've done those tweaks to, uh, to accommodate that on a per building basis on the educational adequacy side. Um, on the facility assessment side, um, we got input from each um, head custodian at every building to find out what their issues were. And so we feel pretty good that we've got their items covered in here. Um, I guess the tricky part of this is going to be, again, that sort of concept of this is a point in time, a picture, right? And, and, and if we keep, at some point, you kind of have to say, you know, we're, we're working with the data that we have and, and we're not going to, and we're going to allow enough flexibility moving forward so that it accommodates small revisions that are going to have to happen because we're never going to get it down completely perfect to every uh, oh, sorry, I just cut you off. Completely agree. When I look at the report and see room utilization, facility utilization, and all of the calculations right there with you, as long as that um, the building administrator looks at the population and, you know, just some key data points that they know and give you the flexibility on, on the calculations, but just to make sure, because I get that there is a data collection process. Now, that's a ton of data uh, if there's just a validation process to make sure that as accurate of information, baseline information as possible goes into the process. And the principals have done that for, for their each individual buildings for, for those pieces. As part of collection or validation? Could, afterwards, okay, thank you. And Dang, the previous data was, of course, a year ago when we first did it. So this, this mm, few months ago, I guess, a couple months ago is when we did that, that validation on the, with the principals on the adequacy side. And even more current, uh, last week or the week prior, we brought the principals into review as well. Yeah, I, I was just going to bring that up. We had them in it, in on Tuesday. Um, we went through this presentation with them. Um, gave them access to the raw files with the floor plan so that they could check it out. And actually that's why um, Tammy Van Dyke in at uh, Da Vinci sprung to mind when I was talking about capacity, right? Because they have a very specialized thing going on there and they've got a waiting list and they are full. The way that they're looking at buildings as things that you cram people into is, is a little bit different than the way, you know, Tammy looks at, at her building. So, I don't, I want, I want to make sure we don't get hung up on the 
differences in capacities listed um, here. We need we need to make sure that um, that the building can handle what we intend to go on inside of it. Whereas their study of the buildings as structures don't necessarily take into account those those programmatic aspects within a building. Brian. And this is for you, Josh. Um, the enrollment numbers, I assume, correlate to the um, presentation we had earlier this year as far as our enrollment predictions. Correct. We, they were up to, yeah, the, the latest capacity and stuff was updated from latest enrollment or, or the latest demographic information yes. that you just sent. Yep. Andrew? So, so just, just to be clear, since there's a lot of information coming out here, um, I guess this goes to Josh. Um, there will absolutely be, uh, as long as there's still AGR, there absolutely will be elementary classrooms that will be intentionally staffed well under 25 with some of that grant money. It's just the precise locations of them may vary as um may vary yeah specifically with agr certainly but i mean who knows there could be there could be something unrelated to a, a grant where the board um you know instructs administration to staff at say 15 um for some reason right um brian for the public not myself could you remind us what agr stands for It's a achievement gap reduction, and yeah, and it 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 used to be sage. So um, in in the days when it was sage, um, the classroom size was a required component um, to be eligible for that grant money. Under AGR, uh, class size is one of multiple levers you can pull um, to help with um, in, in schools with. Uh, with higher uh, socioeconomically challenged populations. Andrew? And I'm, this, I realize this may come into play um, later, but just as people are, you know, people are gonna be starting to think about, you know, think about space and we're probably gonna start getting calls and emails probably um, immediately, just, um, can you tell me roughly how what what is the square footage of district office building? I don't have that on at the tip of my fingers. Can we get that? Can we get that? No, I that. <laughs> There you go. You got it. I got it this time. Can we get that for, to you right after? I'm afraid it, it would take me a little while to dig that one up. Sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you. That's, that's my question. Yeah. I think we can move forward. I think Chuck's going to talk through <clears throat> the, the next steps, but I wanted to just begin with a couple of points. Um, we recognize that these discussions will cause anxiety for our staff and for parents and for community members. Uh, once the task force presents their recommendations, there will be opportunity for feedback from students, from staff, from community members, from parents. Um, we recognize that change is needed. We have two major issues that we're facing, uh, a fiscal cliff that begins in August of 24, and declining enrollment. Uh, Lori Blakesley had shared, uh, she dug up that birth rates in Wisconsin have declined by 17%. So again, this isn't just a Green Bay issue. This is, isn't just a Wisconsin issue either. And while change is hard, uh, we as staff are really focused on the opportunities. What comes out of this is potential for greatness to turn Green Bay into a true destination district. 
And that's my hope of what comes out of this work coming ahead. So uh, Nancy and Chuck, if you could talk us through next steps. Yes, thank you. What a great segue. And I, I it basically you took the words right out of my mouth. I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, and there's challenges leading into it that that are not uncommon, but it does provide an opportunity to really um, refocus on student learning in the best possible way. So um, I think it's all positive. Um, the next step is, and, and you as the board are the deciding uh, body for <clears throat> all these decisions, but it's vitally important to get the community involved at this point and share, the next step is to share this information with the community uh, through the task force starting uh, this week on Wednesday and, and get start to get their head around what the challenges are with Green Bay Public Schools financially and with dropping enrollment and then what the opportunities are and for them to understand and some members will have now more knowledge than others of how great the schools already are and and how to improve them or they'll have ideas on how to improve them others will be brought along and we'll do that on a on a quick uh basis. I think we have eight or nine scheduled meetings uh, over the next few months with those with that group and uh, intend to educate them on all of the information shared tonight and then start looking at options, looking at solutions that they can bring back to you, hopefully with a with a unified recommendation or several recommendations for how to move forward. And then again, it's, you know, the ball ultimately is always in your court. Um, but this, this piece, I think, is very exciting, getting the community's input, getting their, uh, getting them, first of all, educated, because this is a large business. Again, it's, it's like running a, a city, essentially, of facilities and getting them to understand all of the options, all the challenges, all the uh, things we've been discussing tonight. Yeah, you know, the yeah, buts, the capacity is this, but uh, what about AGR? What about this? What, you know, and, and get them uh, very knowledgeable on all these little uh, facets of, of the education business. And then um, by spring, by May, coming forward with a recommendation to you uh, from the committee, not from staff, not from ATSNR, but from, from the community on what they think are good options. And then you'll have that opportunity to, to sit with that, I think, over the summer and, and get input from the rest of the community, from parents, from teachers, uh, from people at the grocery store talking about this and, and really, um, get a chance to get some in-depth information on, on how people feel about those options. And maybe that will ultimately involve a, a different option. So, um, you know, we're kind of in the middle of the process and I think we're getting into a very exciting part. Not that I don't mind gathering data, but I, I think sharing that data and getting input from your community is is really a, an exciting component. So that's next. Just some clarification on the timeline. Uh, what our goal is, um, is to have the facilities task force present to the Board of Education their recommendation at the work session in May. And then uh, have public comment in a variety of ways, but actually uh, physically at a meeting at the regular board meeting in May, so May 22nd, public comment and then board discussion with the goal of the board making some decisions at a special board meeting on June 5th. Thank you. Thank you very much for allowing us to do the study for you. We really have enjoyed the process and enjoyed working with your wonderful staff and team. And we look forward to the next portion. Yes, thank you very much. 
Yeah, thank you. This is um, a huge amount of work and information that you've provided us. So um, any other questions before Brian? I just want to add, I think it's fantastic how members of our community are stepping up for this community, for the work, the task force on it. I mean, this, this is another indication of how Green Bay has stepped up to support our students and support our buildings and our staff and our school district in general. And I want to thank, and I'm sure the rest of the board joins in on this, thank the community members that have stepped up for this because it's going to be a lot of work and it, it's just showing their commitment. So thank you. Andrew. Um, and I, I just wanted to clarify too, with the, um, so with the committee, we're, um, you know, there'll be plenty of information they'll be provided, but they are, um, it's an advisory committee to the board and they are, they'll be basically completely free to make their own recommendation, correct? So they may say, yep, saving money is important, but neighborhood schools is more important to us. Or they might say, hey, having bigger schools, you can do so much more here. They could say that. Um, and then it's up to up to us also then to review the data and so forth. But um, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. This is the task force work. We're going to become we're going to come with some preliminary options as starter points. But what we typically find is you never end up with exactly what we started with because it's a process of their understanding. And you have all the cultural factors that that come into it and, and things that you value as a community and all of those things, this has to be your community's decision. This is not our decision or your staff's commission decision. This is your community's decision that they, as that task force representation, work together to find what is the right fit for you. This is not coming from the other side. It's their work, definitely. James? Just a question for you. Um, leveraging your experience and running this process in uh, other districts, um, would how would you advise the board to be as constructive as possible? A, leaving, staying out of the work, uh, the task force work, right? But informing the the task force of um, some of the things that the board values, right? Andrew spoke to that and. You know, it's been my experience in business that, you know, governing bodies say, here are the objectives, the business objectives that we're trying to uh, achieve, go figure out how, right? Now, I get the task force is all about the how, but how would you advise the board interact or inform the, um, the task force of some objectives and, and some criteria that we would value and use as part of our evaluation of the proposal, right? Because uh, Andrew's right. I would hate for a task force to run six, eight weeks, right? And then for us to come and be put on a spot in a couple of meetings and say, well, we don't value your proposal. Now what? Right? And I would, I would, I want to avoid that situation. So you know, I, I would see us potentially as a board taking on the work to come up with some key not directives, but some policy statements that we would envision. But I don't want to constrain, right? And I know that there's a tightrope to walk there, but I want at least to allow us to surface our individual things that we see as either showstoppers or things that we want to see out of this process so that they, they at least know where they are diverging and can in their proposal, explain why they're diverging from what we've asked for, so. I think about what happened with the county board and they put the task force together to talk about the maps and the redistricting. And the task force brought their proposal to the county board and it had two additional districts and the county board is like, we are not creating two additional districts. There's no way. And they threw out all the work that that task force did. And I think that's what we're trying to avoid. If they're, you know, <laughs> I think it's silly, but if crossing the river is going to be a barrier that we are never, as a board, going to vote on, then I think we need to make sure that the task force is aware of that. That being said, I think it's really important we let them do their work and tell us <laughs> tell us what they do. But, you know, from a guiding principle standpoint, I like three. I wouldn't do more than three, <laughs> you know, but, yeah. Chuck, do you want to go first? 
Yeah, I think uh, someone mentioned it's a tightrope, and it really is. I, you don't want to restrict the work of the task force, and I certainly understand. You know, if you've got if you've got non-negotiable showstoppers, that you know, and my recommendation would be in our in the past we've had the board basically stay stay out of the process, and we've had board members attend a few meetings, but just as audience and not participate. Um, you know, obviously we've had, we've had board members or board chairs make opening statements to the, to the task force, thanking them for their participation. And, you know, if, if I, my recommendation would be if as a board, you can come up with a few items that, that, and values and that you want to share that you think are important for them to know up front. Uh, to avoid that situation of, you know, throwing out all the work at the end, that would be good to do. And maybe you as a board can come up with a few and I don't know if you can do it this week, but, you know, we've got a couple meetings before we get into the meat of discussions of options. So there is some time, but I think, uh, you know, yeah, sharing that information with the board would be valuable, um, but trying to stay out you know, and not be perceived as controlling the process because you really want uh, your community to take ownership in it. James? So I, I agree I, with you um, then that we're talking only about a, a few items. And I think what I would suggest is that we share them with the facilitator uh, first, right, and make sure that there is, we're not encroaching, right, into that how, um, but we're also communicating, um, you know, some some things that are, are very important um, to to the process out there. Yeah. So, I, oh, sorry, didn't mean. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm willing to take on the work of creating a, a thought starter and doing some socializing with. The, the board members uh, so that we all have a, an opportunity to con you know, contribute and, you know, through, you know, uh, appropriate means come up with some directives. So James has already vocalized some of these concerns to me before the meeting and we did, we have had a little bit of discussion about this, but now we, now that everyone is on the same page with that, I think we should open that up. And I, 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 trust James to accumulate that and and then you know put put something together it'll be carefully carefully done yeah I mean we, we I think we all agree we don't want to um, weigh this task force down um, from the work that they've been um, asked to do so um, we'll be very very conscious of that I just want to reassure you and Chuck um, so well, James and I will talk about that. And we'll get back to the board a little bit, um, and then we'll see what we'll come up with. How's that? That, that sounds, sounds great. great. Yeah, yeah, and you. you know, I think, and you're absolutely right in the thought of you don't want to put too hard of a finger down on the uh, on it, right? And as long as they are, as you said, principles or recommendations, because the interesting thing may be they may come up with something that because you may say, "Oh, we don't want to do this," but they may come up with some idea that you go, "Oh." I didn't think of that in that way. If they do this, that may actually work after all. So, you know, I think you certainly you want them to know your values, but you also want to be careful that you don't let them, you know, just allow them to be free in their their ideas. And I, I would be careful of physical constraints. I mean, like I know you gave the river thing as an example. I'd be careful about that one because depending upon the configuration, it may or may not be okay, right? It depends on how much and what's happening and what it is, and it may be very specific to the solution. It's so it's been historically, it's been, mm -hmm. I know it's, that one's there. It's been historically impossible. I know, I know, and believe me, we, as we've been starting to look at options, that <laughs> blue line's right down the middle, yeah. and we're very cognizant of it and and of its effects. You here know, I thought here and here I thought the Mississippi River was the only one you couldn't cross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Laura. I also just wanted to, um, I agree with everything that's been said and I appreciate you taking the lead on that, James. I think our district mission though is also has to always be at the forefront. And I think mm -hmm. that 
we can always go back to, okay, well, this with the task force, which you guys are probably already on this, but you know, does this align, this plan that you guys are recommending, does it really align with our mission? Is it really going to be this for all of our students or is this really going to just be for these amount of students? So I think that is a huge guiding um, statement for us as we move forward in the project. And as it comes to us too, to think about that. We actually had started a guiding principle <laughs> statement already, excuse me, already that had uh, kind of uh, that was referencing yours and, and we're tweaking it a little bit now to better incorporate your actual wording. So yeah, we, we were already going there. Okay. Andrew. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to make sure that um, <clears throat> it isn't lost here that the, you know, so I think sometimes, sometimes people were look at the river boundary like um you know something that is just uh <clears throat> just a quaint idea that has long outlived its usefulness um and if but there are practical applications uh, there are certainly the um you can draw you can draw a line between uh two points that are a thousand feet apart and one of them is one of them is a walkable situation for a neighborhood school and another one even with a pedestrian accessible bridge is not something you would do with certain ages or if you did it you would bus across it and that creates a whole new dynamic and and expense so i think there's certainly room to you know there's certainly room for for creativity um and certainly we have people um, crossing the river to uh, choice to different programs uh, around our district. Um, but it is both, you know, it is both a, it, it is both, a, both includes historical traditions, but also actual practical implications. Absolutely. And and we have recognized in as we're doing again these initial options, which is probably not where it's going to end up, but they're starters, right? That that that's very much been on our mind and the idea of trying to minimize that crossing as much as possible. And you know, some of them do that better than others. Some of them are completely clean and some of them have a little bit here and there. But certainly that's been a goal because we recognize at a minimum, the transportation issues associated with that, besides all the other factors. And, and Josh has been doing um, some preliminary um, boundary checking for us with his boundary software to see how some of these preliminary options start to work um, when you change things around and what the impacts are and does this create a donut and it'd be better if you did this so you didn't have the, you know, all of those kind of things. He's helped us tweak these a little bit um, with the boundary software. So we, you know, that they, they have been at least preliminarily vetted with what we know at the time and then they're going to change from here as they're in the community input occurs. James. Uh, I, this may be a silly question, so excuse it. So having looked at the numbers, right, and I'm calling these numbers keep the lights on kind of numbers that you presented in, um, tonight. Um, it doesn't represent any um, initiatives that would you know, improve the, the future you know, educational readiness of the facilities. Um, so I'm used to being presented a budget guideline, right? Because looking at this task, I can imagine a set of proposals that range from here to way out here. So as a, as a board whose primary responsibility is very fiduciary in nature and, and, and taking care of taxpayer dollars, I would hate again for a proposal that's well outside of our range to come up and be the primary proposal um, that then we're put on the defensive um, uh, and, and we're, we're struggling again with having to jettison a lot of work for something that if known in advance, we might have altered the solutions. I, it's not a how, but everyone has to live within constraints, so. So what we're, what we're doing with the, with we are coming with, I think, well, I forget now if it's four or five that we've ended up with, with the, as, as we get into a couple couple meetings from now. Um, we're going to be 
um, after the initial, over, we're first gonna do a quick overview of them so everyone can kind of get their arms around them in general. And then we're gonna spend a couple meetings going over them in the, the starters in more detail and they're gonna have costs associated with them that are related to um, both, for instance, if a, a building intends to go offline for one reason or another, um, there's, there is a yearly savings there in, um, what's the term, Josh? I can't, operational. operational, thank you, I can't spit that out. <laughs> operational savings, right? That you wanna get a handle on that. And then there's at least these high priorities facilities costs we're talking about. And we've been having some discussions about, well, do you just put the high priority or do you put the medium priority in there too? Or do you take a certain, if you know you can't afford all of that, do you take a certain percentage of it and say you're going to reallocate it once you know exactly what you're doing? We're still trying to, with your team, trying to fine tune exactly which pieces of that go in there. And then also some for the buildings that may be considering additions, we're gonna to start to put, um, we'll start to do some just basic preliminary plans for how that might work and some costs for those. So we're gonna end up with some, you know, not, you know, super, super accurate, but general idea cost numbers for each one of the options that then as we develop options from there, we'll be able to take that data and put it into the various options that they have. So if they end up, you know, I doubt this will happen, but the, say they go, I want three new buildings <laughs> for whatever reason, right? That, that cost is going to show up in, in there and they're going to get an idea because the, the our first, this coming Wednesday, um, we're, we're doing this, this presentation, basically. And then the following two weeks from there, your staff is doing demographics and budget. So they are going to know fiscally where you guys are at. And, and at, you know, if there's a decision that you want to give some kind of a, a range or a recommendation to them, even from a principal standpoint about where roughly, and maybe you don't know that yet, I'm not sure, um, you know, where roughly you want to be, if that's a guidepost for them, maybe that's not a bad thing either. So they don't go so crazy far afield. And maybe it's a big range for now and it gets fine tuned later. That's for you guys to think about. I'm not really sure if, if you wanna go there or not, but um, Josh, did you wanna say something? Yeah, and perhaps that could be, you know, you're working on your um, instructions to the, the task force. Um, you know, perhaps the board wants a goal like uh, not increasing the tax rate as a result of any capital projects or or something like something like that just to give them some bounds budgetarily. So actually hearing this, I would love to be able to work with the district because um, if the board had access to the assumptions that went into any financial modeling around these, that would help us go wait, no, put the mediums in there as well, right? Because I want to be conservative in modeling versus and just being able to see that potentially um, as you guys work. So whenever I hear, I'm going to work with the district, the district's outside of task force as well. So I'm going to determine, you know, hey, can we see that uh, as well? If it helps in the evaluation, um, because yeah, Josh, you're right. You're, I'm looking at that level, right? To say, um, you know, we can't change the mill rate, right? That that's that would be a principle that uh, I think would be really easy for us to come up with and help us evaluate the cost of solutions. Brian? I wanna kind of address that question with it as well. This is also a once in a generation opportunity for us to make sure that while we're being fiscally responsible and we're doing it with respect to the, the funds that the community has invested with us, there's also opportunities to really reshape some issues on here. And I think we also need to take into consideration that we're meeting our goals and making sure our students are prepared for the future, for jobs, for education, for all opportunities on that. And that when we're looking at options and consideration on that, there there could be some capital expenses on there and that that's priced out, but we're, we've got two goals on there. One of them is being fiscally responsible and, and the fiduciary responsibility with the funds, but also in making sure that we have top-notch schools so we can 
make sure our community students have all of the resources they need and we can do it financially, you know, in a, in a strong manner. So we can make this district, the district of choice and the other concerns with it. So I think we just need to make sure we're aware of that as well. If we have one person or one board member on that, we still have to bring it forward, you know, as uh, for those considerations. So thank you. Laura. Um, I, you have to hit your thing. Sorry. I agree with you, Brian. Um, I just want to mention that there are other districts in the state who are going through this process. Everyone, you know, they're, they're forced to kind of reevaluate the structure of their, of their district, just like we are, um, due, due to all kinds of processes that are out of our control. Um, we can't control the birth rate, you know, we can't control what the state legislature does. Uh, so we, we have to, um, you know, we, we have to do this work. Um, so we know that change is constant in our school district. Um, change is hard. Um, but when I think about this task force and this process, I think about the, 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 what we're doing really is, is talking about the future. Um, we're talking 30 years out. We're talking about the generations to come. And, um, and it's really, really important that we keep focused on that. And we're going to have to be kind of brave, um, you know, because because we're talking about people's schools, and and of course that is hits right at your heart. So um, I think this board is up for this. I I trust everyone on this board to understand the the depth and the weight of it, this process, and to roll up their sleeves and get at it. Um, and I agree. I am incredibly grateful to who, the people on this task force. Um, I, I think um, they're going to understand this mission with the help of, of your facilitator. And um, I look forward to seeing what they come up with. Thank you. I think, are we, any other questions or concerns? Info we should, sounds great. So it sounds like you're going to be working on that kind of a few guiding principles and maybe range of of things without, and I know you're going to find that right balance for us to to be able to give them a little guidance and and impetus to go forward and do great work. So, thank you so much. Yes, thank yeah, you. You did an awesome job. Thank you. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, Chuck. Yep. <laughs> Josh, Josh will help you. You got it. Okay, so that was our big item for operations. We've got three more things we need to get through. Um, contracts under Wisconsin statute section 118.24, that's gonna be school district administrator contracts. Vicki, is that you? Yeah, this just this ensures we are compliant with state statute and allows us to move forward with issuance of administrator contracts according to the timeline that's set forward by the, forward by the state. So we'll be bringing that to the next board meeting. Is there any discussion on this? Brian. Is this a new policy or is this just reconsideration of one that's existing? Not policy, this is admin contracts. Okay, anything else? Alrighty, this will be brought forward at our regular board meeting for a vote in two weeks. Okay, um, next item under operations is item C, the purchase of Centagix and single wire. And this is going to be Josh and Amy. Oh, Amy's remote. Hi, Amy. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I think this is mostly Amy, actually. Yeah, this has been a great team effort. Um, Josh started this work last year, and then this year we continued it and um, teamed up with Chris Collar as well, our safety and security manager. He's been a big help too. So what we're looking at is we've heard from building admins, um, other leadership throughout the district that we really need some sort of visual cues in the case of a crisis. So for example, if um, you're deaf or hard of hearing, you very well may not hear a fire alarm, but you would see the flashing lights, right? Same thing. 
we're looking for that if we have a crisis in the building, such as um, an active shooter. So Syntegix and Single Wire are two companies that work very close together. Syntegix um, consists of a badge that staff members would wear. And Josh, I should have given you some of those to pass around today. Um, if I remember, I'll try to get those at the, the board meeting. But it's a badge just like the ones we currently have that has a button on it. And if you push that button, um, I am three times, thank you. The badge will notify personnel within the district or within your building that you need assistance with something. The three click means you need something that is um, an emergency, but it, we don't have to make the whole building aware. So maybe there is an incident in the hallway or a student falls down and breaks a, their arm out on the playground, three clicks, you get assistance. If you click the badge eight times or more, that is where you need to notify the whole school of a situation. So that might be an active shooter situation. Tied to Syntegix or along with Syntegix, they have strobes that are put into place. And the strobes you can see on the attached, but the board attachments, you can see it kind of looks like a um, fire alarm or a, a smoke detector. And if you click that button eight or more times, it's going to cause that strobe to go off. The strobes can be programmed to do different light colors. So we would work with Chris, building for admins, their team to figure out, you know, blue means this, green means this, red means that, whatever it might be. That is Syntegix. That's one, so that's like half of the solution. The second half of the solution is where single wire comes into play. And you can think of single wire as more of the software, the back end components. The single wire solution allows us to take the notification system that's going through the bat, through the strobes and push out messages to district displays, computers, TVs, digital signage, um, through our Zoom phones, our PA systems, um, possibly the walkie talkies that the monitors walk around with or the building admins. So it's the software system that ties everything together that's taking place within Syntegix with those badges and those strobes. Um, it's my understanding that right now there currently isn't anybody in the state of Wisconsin that's doing this. So like many things, Green Bay would be a leader in the state um, showing, you know, our, our need to really make sure that our students and our staff members have the, the ability to be safe within our buildings and then get that help that they need when, when it's called upon. That's a very high level overview. Josh, did I miss anything or can I clarify anything? Yeah, that's, that's a good overview. I wanted to add um, a couple of things. Um, first, <clears throat> with the visual cues, it's not just, you know, for students and staff who are hard of hearing. We have um, spaces within the district where it's extremely difficult or impossible to hear a PA. So think about a gym class. Think about um, in the middle of um, orchestra rehearsal, right, where that PA is going off. It may be a very important message. There's nothing in the classroom indicating that there's any action to be taken. Um, also, um, you, we run into issues um, with these, you know, these secure the building situations, which uh, you and the community are aware of, um, that happen every now and then, usually because of a situation within our community that, um, you know, one, no one's allowed in or out, but business as usual within the school, right? That's a fairly common thing if the police are dealing with a, a situation in the neighborhood. There's no external indication on a building that so a building's in that situation. So, so we do have um, we do have staff um, potentially attempting to enter buildings when when they shouldn't be entering buildings, and I, I'm thinking specifically of. Um, 
it, it could be dangerous in, in certain situations, right? You imagine um, if if the police are inside because of a, a potential issue and and someone's coming through a door, I I would hate to see a I would hate to see a staff member get tased because they didn't know that the building was in that sort of a, a situation. Um, the strobes are wireless, so you know we we've recognized for several years that we need some way to visually represent that there's an issue in the building. Um, all of the solutions we had seen to this point involved running wires everywhere you needed a strobe, um, which is would be impossible and cost prohibitive. Um, these one of the things that makes the solution attractive is that they are wireless. They go up anywhere. They're battery powered. They're constantly monitored. Um, that's part of the agreement we have with them: the remote monitoring to make sure that they're working. Um, so you can stick them really anywhere, including outdoors on playgrounds, um, in athletic venues outdoors, um, in parking lots. So we're able to cover a lot more of our, um, I guess, of our sites. So that's that's one thing I, I kind of wanted to, to bring up. And then secondly, what this also allows for is a centralized platform to manage these sorts of events at a school. Because right now we've got essentially 43 different systems for for um, for handling these these secure the building situations. So this allows us to centrally handle it um, through Chris Collar's office um, and have it handled immediately. Josh, can I add in some of the questions that our admins asked of us um, at our last admin meeting? They wanted to know what buildings this would be placed in, and we stated all district-owned buildings. And they were also curious about, like, does this badge track me, right? Um, and the answer is no. So each staff member in our district would be provided one badge that would work throughout the district, and it works the badge communicates with the strobes. So once you get a certain distance away from the strobes, the badge stops working. So when you leave school and head to the gas station, go pick up your children, go home, the badge does not know where you are. And it, to clarify, it doesn't know where you are unless you click the button on the badge. It's yes. not actively tracking, even if you are within range of a strobe. Good point. And this is ESSER dollars we'll be using to fund this? Correct. Okay, Brian. I assume that the data will also be able to be um, recorded. So say you're in a building where you notice you're getting more calls for assistance um, that would help, that could potentially help with staffing concerns or rotations mm -hmm. of monitors knowing where kind of the hot spots are in, in buildings to address that and would that access would that information be available to the principals if requested that's a really good question um i will note that and ask and I have asked that last year actually. oh did you oh yes. good they, what did you hear they do um they do have a reporting system that okay. can make that information available so you can know if yeah if there are hot spots within your building um what kinds of incidents are happy, happening mm -hmm. where, um, that kind of stuff. I think about back to my days when I was in the classroom and every time I needed assistance, not every time, most of the times, it was like in the hallway, in the cafeteria. It was someplace outside of my classroom where I wasn't by a phone. So think about how that will expand our ability to support our classroom teachers. Right, or you're handling a student that's having some significant behavioral issues, and it's mm -hmm. a problem getting to a phone to to make that alert because you you know you're dealing with the the student's own safety and the safety of others. Laura, I'm curious if there's other districts that have used these systems together, and if you've had any feedback on that since we can't do Amazon reviews. We did uh, the the um, the majority of the the customers? The company's based out of Georgia. Uh, majority of their customers are in the South and Southeast. Um, we spoke with Henry County in Georgia last year. Um, we've got a couple of other references in Georgia and Georgia, Florida, Georgia, Florida, and Texas. 
and all larger school districts, 48 schools plus. Yeah, those are county school districts down mm -hmm. there. So they're just they're large, they're very large. It would be like instead of Green Bay Public Schools, Brown County School District. Nancy, and then we will go to Brian. So like if you're in a school and there's something going on and you click three times, then will all the other things that are in place go into place again? You know, like if you like when I was teaching at Elmore, there's team A and team B. So so this all those other things will still be in place. It's just um, okay. Yeah, the answer was yes. Yeah, it's just an easier way to call your safety team, um, essentially, from, from the teacher's end. And then it has the added benefit of adding these visual cues and the centralized management. Okay. James. Um the request is the 1.8 million is that all cost for five years or is there some recurring cost after the initial 1.8 all costs for five years oh thank you and that is for both um the centegics and the single wire solutions together so the 123 for the software cost that's not an annual license that's for all five years okay thank you correct yep um in response to it kind of ties into the ability to record data on this would it also record the response time so i think of when I've gone to stores and hit the little button and sometimes I waited five minutes or sometimes I waited 30 seconds and also who's able to respond because I'm assuming that if we have the the badge or the clicker with it that's tied to whoever the person is but when they deactivate it when the situation's been resolved or a, a way to record who's responding in the length of time That's another good question, Josh. I don't know if you asked that, but I know the the system. It, like, if I push the button three times and my SRO officer responds, they might mark that they're responding on their device before they actually get to me. If that makes sense, right? Um, one one feature of the system is if you're a teacher and or if you're anyone with a badge and you you call for assistance, you are emailed a um, a survey asking about how how it went. I I guess I'm concerned because at times we hear um, from staff members that support hasn't come in in a timely manner, and I think this just provides us the opportunity to improve on that with with numbers, you know, to see that, okay, we're, we're not fully acknowledging a situation, maybe because of whatever lens we're looking through at it, or, you know, different perspectives. But if I'm in a building, and I've asked for help, and it takes 10 minutes for someone to get there, that's an area for us to improve on. Um, and it will give us that, that quantitative data to use that. And just as looking at the physical locations of it, the numbers and the time response and who responds, I think is a key point for us to look at for it. So if it's available and it should be. Yeah, we can definitely look into that and see what we can find out. So it's a three month implementation. This would be ready for the start of the school year in fall. Yes, they gave us a 90 to 120 day rollout period from the day that we put the PO in. Brian? We would also be able to control the message. So if you have a kindergarten class and they're using their, their computer to display something, we want to make sure that it's age appropriate for whatever the message is that comes up on a building to building level or classroom to classroom. Does that make sense? Or Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And then to have the possibly images versus text, depending on, on where we're at. But I don't think we would push out necessarily to student computers at the, the little age, but still to have that awareness of what's on like digital signage or the TV or the smart board, absolutely. 
yeah, I think he was more concerned about the the teacher's device if, mm -hmm. if there was a takeover and and the teacher was presenting to the classroom. Yeah, to absolutely. Make sure that we're not scaring kids, which which makes sense. And the, you know, the same goes for the PA message too, because there's audio that that you record and program to go with each of the scenarios too. You want to obviously that's going to vary from school to school. Yeah, One and Syntegix Syn will stick by us with um, our onboarding, so they will be with us when we pass out badges to the staff members, and then support us through, like if we have an Alice training or if, you know, whatever kind of drill, this system would be put into place for that so that we're not only giving our staff members the opportunity to, to know what this sounds like and feels like, but our students as well. Okay, anything else? All right, this will come to our regular board meeting in two weeks for us to vote on. Um, the last item under operations is item D, purchase of uninterrupted power supply. And I'm assuming this is Josh and Amy again. It is. Um, going to RFP for our uninterrupted power supplies, also known as UPSs, is a typical component of our refresh cycle. Typically it's once every five years that we go out to um, RFP for this purchase. Our UPSs are, think of them as like a, a backup battery for all of our network equipment. So if we have a short time where the power is down, the UPS kicks in and powers everything up so that we still have our phones, our security cameras, access to the Wi-Fi, so on and so forth. Um, we went out to bid for the UPSs just recently. We received quite a few bids back. Um, and you can see the selection criteria contains both E-rate eligible costs and non-E-rate eligible costs. And of the bids that we looked at, we had five qualifying bids. We were offered a 10-year warranty with the UPS, which doubles the lifespan that we currently have within our refresh cycle. Um, this purchase is to be made with E-rate funds. And if you're new to the E-rate game, there's lots of steps that we have to go through. The first thing that we go through with E-rate is called a Form 470. And that's where we um, seek our services. We say, this is what we're looking for. Then we can, we simultaneously go through the RFP process. Once we choose who we would like to move forward with, then we fill out a form 471, which is where we request from um, the government through USAC, we request the funding. So right now we are at the point where we will be requesting funding with board approval here. And then we sit and we wait until we get a funding commitment letter. And the funding is to reimburse 80% of every dollar that we spend. So of the dollar amounts that you see listed, the district with the assistance of E-rate only pays 20% of that cost. The rest of the 80% is refunded to us. So we will not move forward with purchase until we get a funding commitment letter from E-Rate stating, yes, we will give you 80% back. And then we budget for the remaining 20% in our 23-24 school year budget. Questions on this one? James? Across all the vendors, are we talking about the same brand of UPS? Are we comparing apples to apples or are they different brands? They were different. Um, different same. brands, different battery types. Okay, so um, can you explain why so much emphasis on in the rubric for um, local availability? Because that seems to take a very... Uh, low priced solution and kind of knock it out of contention. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, why is local availability um, such an important factor? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of the vendors that were putting in bids from out of the area, they wanted to come in and work for like 10 consecutive days, right? Well, we know that we can't necessarily do this work during the school day. So having somebody local provides the ability for them to, I don't know, come into our buildings from like three to seven, right? Work outside of when our students are in building. Um, it also provides us for just that local support. So we did have a few vendors that were new, the Quality Power Solutions. This is a new vendor to us, but they're out of the Madison area. Um, and then Cap, Cap Data and CDW, of course, are close to us as well, um, but not headquartered here. Good question. So just to make sure I understand, they're doing the installs. The correct, correct, yes. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. This will come um, to our board meeting in two weeks for us to vote on, and that concludes the operations committee or agenda. Thank you, John. Um, that is that concludes our our agenda for tonight. Um, I um, I just want to kind of remind everybody that the state convention is next week. Vicki and Laura is going to come down for a little bit. I'll be down there um, and participating in the delegate assembly and a, very, a whole bunch of other things. So that's next week. Um, and other than that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, we're adjourned. Thanks, everybody.